at and then the NIH Metabolomics Interest Group webinar series. Today's webinar from Dr. Mary Playden will focus on nutritional metabolomics to identify biomarkers of dietary patterns and specific diet exposures and its application to understanding breast cancer etiology. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to quickly review a few logistics. So uh, first, should you experience any technical difficulties, you can feel free to contact us through the questions box in the expanded control panel or by phone or email. If you need to view live closed captioning, please click on the link that will appear in the chat box. I believe it's already there, so please click on that link. And also, at the end of Dr. Clayton's presentation, we will allow time for questions. If at any time during the presentation you have a question, though, please feel free to type it in the question box, um, and then I will ask it on your behalf at the end of the Q&A. So don't wait. You can just type your questions in as the um, presentation is going on. So, okay, today it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary Playden. Dr. Playden joined the National Cancer Institute's Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics in August of 2014 as a pre-doctoral fellow through the Yale University NCI Partnership Training Program. She completed a Bachelor of Science and a Master's of Public Health at the Queensland University of Technology in Australia. Dr. Playden, has, it, Dr. Playden is a registered dietitian practicing in both Australia and England before coming to the United States. Her research interests include nutritional epidemiology, metabolomics, and etiology and survivorship of female cancers. As a, post as a postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Playden continues her work on nutritional metabolomics and cancer etiology and has expanded her portfolio to include alcohol and obesity exposures and their relationships to hormone metabolism and other female cancers, including endometrial cancer. So if you can all just give me a minute to get Dr. Playden's slides up, I would appreciate it. Okay, just give me one more second. All righty, so I'd like to um, turn it over to Dr. Playden. Thanks, Krista. Thanks, everyone, for being here. So as Krista mentioned, today I'm going to present some recent work on nutritional metabolomics and its application to understanding breast cancer etiology. But first, I'd like to propose this question to you. Does diet matter for cancer prevention? It's currently estimated that around a third of the most common cancers could be prevented through diet, weight control, and physical activity. Now, this is very important because cancer is the second leading cause of death in the US and the leading cause for some age groups. And the prevalence is increasing worldwide. If we can identify lifestyle strategies that are modifiable for, can for preventing cancer, we could dramatically impact cancer rates. Here on the screen is a summary of what we know so far about foods and cancer risk based on the American Institute for Cancer Research World Expert Report. On the left, we have a list of food exposures, and along the top, we have a list of cancers. The dark pink squares show that the food convincingly increases cancer risk. The dark blue squares show convincingly decreased risk. And then the yellow circles highlight where some of the evidence is stronger, but Clearly, there are lots of empty spaces. There are a lot of exposures where the evidence is not really strong either way. One area that has really interested me personally is breast cancer prevention. Breast cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death among women, and it can lead to long-term associated comorbidities. So far, besides obesity, Alcohol intake is the only definitive diet-related risk factor for breast cancer. Research on many other diet-related factors, for example, fats and fruits and vegetables, has been uh, quite conflicting. One possible reason for the mixed findings is that diet is generally measured using self-reported questionnaires. Now, these are prone to measurement errors that can make it difficult to observe diet associations. One way that we might improve measurement of diet and epidemiological studies is by using objective nutritional biomarkers. But the problem is that only a handful of validated biomarkers currently exist. Metabolomics is an emerging technology, and it can be used to identify nutritional biomarkers in human biospecimens, for example, blood and urine. 
Hundreds of molecules can be measured at one time, including endogenous nutrition and energy balance metabolites and hormones, as well as exogenous food breakdown products. You can see some examples here on the slide. Metabolomics allows for hypothesis generating agnostic type analyses to uncover nutrition related metabolic pathways that may be associated with disease and may not have been previously considered. Secondly, metabolomics provides us with an opportunity to identify new and better nutritional biomarkers for potentially improving measurement of diet exposures. And thirdly, mediation analysis can be used to uncover mechanistic mediators of diet and disease relationships. There are two major questions that I'm going to address today in this webinar. Firstly, there are very few studies that have looked at biomarkers of overall diet quality. And secondly, few studies have looked at nutritional metabolomics and its application to exploring breast cancer etiology. The first analysis that I'll speak about today looked at identifying biomarkers of dietary patterns using metabolomics. Overall diet quality can be measured by scoring how closely food intake patterns align with national dietary guidelines. There is mounting evidence that overall diet quality is associated with lower risk of many chronic diseases and mortality. Even some diseases where no individual foods were associated with risk have been shown to be strongly associated with overall diet quality. Diet quality scores take into account the complexity of an overall pattern of eating. And this includes the fact that components of your diet are often correlated and they might also interact to affect disease risk. There were two objectives for this first study. The first was to identify metabolite associations with four different dietary patterns that are all based on national healthy eating guidelines, as well as the components that make up each of those diet indices. And the second objective was to gain insights into the potential biological mechanisms that are influenced by diet quality. The study population were healthy male Finnish smokers aged 50 to 69 who were participating in the alpha tocopherol beta carotene cancer prevention study, which was a large randomized trial that was conducted in Finland. We used pre-randomization baseline data from five nested case control studies to do a cross-sectional analysis among 1,336 men. And we focused on over 1,300 metabolites that were measured in at least two out of five studies using the Metabolon platform, the commercial platform. These included both known and unknown metabolites. And the interclass correlation coefficients over all metabolites were high across the studies, and that's suggesting that we had good platform reliability. The diet for the 12 months prior to study enrollment was measured using a self-administered food frequency questionnaire. It was very detailed, and it was designed specifically for a male Finnish population. Now, we chose diet indices that had been thoroughly characterized in the Dietary Patterns Methods Project which developed a process to allow dietary patterns to be compared across very diverse cohorts. We used this standardized process to convert the finished food variable into US equivalents before calculating the diet index scores. Here is an example of the four diet indices that we measured. Along the top are the diet indices, and then listed below are the food components that are scored for each diet index. Firstly, the Healthy Eating Index is an index of overall diet quality, and it's based on the US Dietary Guidelines for Americans. The Alternate Mediterranean Diet Score was developed based on epidemiological studies in Europe that investigated mortality risk factors. The Baltic Sea Diet was based on the Baltic Sea Diet Pyramid, and this is specific to Finland to represent a regional diet. And finally, the World Health Organization's Healthy Diet Indicator is based on the International WHO Dietary Guidelines for the Prevention of Chronic Diseases. And I'll just point out that this index has primarily macro and micronutrient components as opposed to whole foods. 
so it represents a contrast to the other three indices. Each index has a slightly different scoring criteria, but they each provide an overall score of diet quality on either a continuous or an ordinal scale. There were three stages of this analysis. Firstly, we looked at the association between metabolites and each diet index using partial spearman correlation. Then we looked at metabolites and each of the components that make up the diet indices. We used fixed effects meta-analysis to derive a summary estimate for each dietary index and metabolite correlation. And we used Bonferrini correction for multiple comparisons. And finally, we did a pathway analysis to look at metabolic pathway, uh, pathways associated with each of the diet indices. And we only looked at metabolic pathways from which we had measured at least five metabolites. For the results, the men in our study were an average age of 57. They were slightly overweight with less than elementary or eighth grade education. They were physically active and heavy smokers. So here are the results for the average healthy dietary pattern scores. For each diet index, a higher score means better compliance or a healthier diet. The maximum scores are listed on the right-hand column. The score for the healthy eating index, to put it into context, was actually quite similar to a recent analysis among non-smoking US adults that was based on National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey data. Overall, there were 23 metabolites that were associated with the healthy eating index at the Bonferrini corrected alpha level. And this included 17 with identifiable chemical structure. So here on this slide, I'm only showing the chemically identified metabolites. The absolute correlations ranged up to 0.2. And we found that the metabolite profile overall reflected most of the underlying components that were used to score adherence. You can see these components um, represented by the different boxes here. For the alternate Mediterranean diet score, there were 46 associated metabolites, including 21 with known chemical identity, and the absolute correlations ranged to 0.3. Most of these were correlated with unsaturated to saturated fat ratio components, but there were also metabolites that were associated with fruits and vegetables, fish and nuts. And again, um, this shows us that we had fairly good representation of many of the components that go into scoring the index. For the Baltic Sea diet, there were 33 associated metabolites. 10 of these were known metabolites. The absolute correlations ranged, ranged up to about 0.2. Again, most metabolites were linked with polyunsaturated, saturated, and trans fat ratio. But uh, there were also metabolites associated with vegetables, whole grains, fish, and reducing fat percentage. For the healthy diet indicator, there were 23 associated metabolites. 11 of those were known, and the correlations ranged up to about 0.2 again. As a reminder, the healthy diet indicator components are based primarily on macro and micronutrients versus whole foods. We saw correlations with polyunsaturated fats and fiber, but not the other components. So clearly, you can see that dietary patterns that are based on whole foods are associated with more diverse metabolite profiles compared with those that are based on macro and micronutrients. Here are the metabolic pathways that were associated with each diet index with Bonferrini correction. Um, all of these pathways were significant at that Bonferrini level. On the y-axis, we have the metabolic sub-pathways. On the x-axis, we have the number of measured metabolites within the pathway overall in red, and then the number that was statistically significant within that pathway in blue. A common theme here is that lysolipid and food or plant xenobiotic pathways contained most metabolites that were associated with diet quality. The lysolipid pathway includes many lysophospholipids that are involved in things like cell signaling, 
energy metabolism and cell membrane integrity. And the food and plant xenobiotics um, include many plant phytochemicals, for example. Pathway analysis, metabolic pathway analysis, um, really provides us with greater power to detect associations than looking at the individual metabolites. Associations might be seen for an overall metabolic pathway, but not the individual metabolites. For example, the, the pentose pathway, which um, in this case includes fruit-related threatol and xylanate, uh, but not these individual metabolites was associated with the healthy eating index as an example. And the same was true for histidine metabolism. Three of the diet indices had unique metabolic pathway associations. For example, chemical metabolism was unique to the healthy eating index. This pathway includes, for example, 2-aminophenyl sulfate, which uh, is a whole grain biomarker. The alternate Mediterranean diet score was uniquely associated with dicarboxylate metabolism, and the Baltic Sea diet was uniquely associated with benzoate metabolism. You can see some of the associated metabolites listed there on the slide. Now I showed you that each diet index had a unique metabolite profile, but there was some overlap, which is listed here. We saw common candidate biomarkers of fruits and vegetables, fish, fatty acid ratio, and whole grains. Common metabolic pathways across the diet indices included lysolipid and food and plant xenobiotic, as well as essential and polyunsaturated fatty acid metabolism. In sensitivity analyses, there were no differences when we additionally controlled for cotinine, and there were no differences between cases and controls. We were able to replicate many metabolite associations with specific food components that have been reported in the literature in prior studies, and uh, some of those are shown here. Um, most of these prior studies uh, also use the Metabolon platform. We also had some potentially novel observations shown here, uh, for example, Galactinate, which is a milk sugar metabolite, was associated with dairy. Homostachydrin, uh, which has previously been extracted from alfalfa and coffee beans, was associated with whole grains and fiber. In another previous analysis of the prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian cancer screening study, five serum metabolites were associated with the healthy eating index. Most of these were vitamin-related metabolites. 3 and 8, but not the other metabolites, was associated with the healthy eating index in the current analysis. This could potentially reflect population differences in dietary intake. For example, these two populations had very different intakes of vitamin E supplements at baseline. Another previous study, the PREDIMED trial, looked at metabolite profiles of Mediterranean diets. Again, our results differed. Uh, but the PREDIMED trial measured their metabolites using NMR, uh, and the Metabolon platform used liquid and gas mass spec. Um, so we don't have you know, complete overlap of the metabolites uh, that are actually measured. There might also have been population differences in dietary intake, uh, such as olive oil use. For example, their study showed strong associations with oleic acid, which is high in olive oil. And olive oil intake would have been um, extremely low in Finland in the 1980s. This first study has a number of strengths that build on prior studies, including a larger sample size, a large number of identified metabolites. We used strict control for multiple comparisons, and the met metabolites were measured using fasting blood samples. A limitation was that uh, the generalizability might be limited since the study population was all male smokers, although we have been able to replicate many of these, the diet component metabolite associations in other studies among women um, non-smokers. In conclusion, uh, we found that diet quality indices representing healthy dietary patterns are associated with serum metabolite levels, 
our results suggest that while there are commonalities, there is not a single unifying um, metabolic association to a healthy diet. Rather, the metabolite profiles of the diet indices that we evaluated um, were strongly associated with the diet index components. And these components uh, reflect different underlying constructs. On replication, future studies could apply these findings to gaining insights into the mechanisms that drive the health effects of diet quality. Metabolomics could help us to define and construct new future diet quality indices that are likely to have a metabolic impact. And finally, we identified several candidate diet component biomarkers. So future studies could potentially evaluate metabolite those particular metabolite characteristics and their measurement error properties to determine if they have utility as dietary biomarkers. Now I'm going to describe another analysis where we looked at nutritional metabolomics and breast cancer risk in a prospective study. For the second study, the objective was to evaluate associations of diet-related metabolites with risk of breast cancer in the prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian cancer screening trial cohort, including estrogen receptor subtype-specific analyses. We used data from a nested case control study within PLCO, which was a large population-based randomized screening trial. The postmenopausal women recruited um, for this study were from the screening arm of the trial. There were 621 incident invasive breast cancer cases and 621 controls matched on age, month and year of blood draw, the year of diagnosis and hormone use. Pre-diagnostic non-fasting serum metabolites were measured, again using the Metabolon platform. In this analysis, we focused focus specifically on 617 metabolites of known identity, so named um, based on chemical standards. The diet was measured at baseline using a food frequency questionnaire. And we used an agnostic approach. We created 54 dietary variables and measured the healthy eating index, um, the 2010 version. The outcomes, the breast cancer outcomes, were ascertained using a number of methods that included state cancer registries, an annual questionnaire with medical record follow-up if breast cancer was indicated. For the analysis, to identify the diet-related metabolites, first we ran partial Pearson correlations to measure the associations between serum metabolites and the dietary items, again with Bonferroni correction. Any metabolites related to diet at that Bonferroni level were carried forward to breast cancer analysis. And we used conditional logistic regression to measure associations between these diet metabolites and breast cancer. The comparison was the 90th versus the 10th percentile of metabolite levels. We also used principal components analysis to identify multiple metabolite component profiles of diet exposures. And then we carried these um, components forward to measuring their association with breast cancer. The women in the study were an average age of 64. The majority were never or former smokers, current drinkers, not diabetic, and overweight or obese. Altogether, 34 of our 55 dietary exposures were associated with at least one metabolite. 113 metabolites were associated with at least one food or diet exposure. And this translated into 222 total correlations, uh, which ranged up to an absolute correlation of about 0.7, which is reasonable for a biomarker study based on self-reported diet. We would anticipate higher correlations um, based on a feeding study, for example. By far, we, obs we observed the most metabolite associations with coffee intake. Uh, many of these observations that you can see here on the slide are actually replicated from prior studies. 
you can see here that we were able to replicate many other diet-related metabolite associations from previous epidemiological studies as well. And we also found some potentially novel candidate biomarkers. I'm defining potentially novel metabolites as those um, not having been reported on in the epidemiological literature to our knowledge. Here you can see that at least 52 replicated to our knowledge, um, and there were many more potentially novel associations. For example, theanine, um, an amino acid extracted from tea leaves that has been studied in vitro in the past, was correlated with tea intake. 3-hydroxypyridine sulfate, which is a phytochemical found in coffee, was correlated with coffee intake. And this plant phytochemical was associated with citrus and other fruits. All of these candidate diet biomarkers are exogenously derived phytochemical constituents. So that provides us with a biological rationale for them acting as diet biomarkers. Here are the alcohol-related metabolites that replicated. And they represent breakdown products of the alcohol, but also changes in endogenous metabolism with alcohol drinking. Specifically, many metabolites that correlated with drinking alcohol were related to androgen metabolism. Now I'm moving on to the breast cancer analysis, which measured the association between those 113 Bonfroni significant diet-related metabolites and breast cancer risk. Overall, we found three metabolites to be associated with overall breast cancer, uh, and that's at the false discovery rate of 0.2. This slide here is color-coded by metabolic superpathways. So two of those metabolites are in the lipid pathway, and one is a cofactor of vitamin. Here I'm presenting the top 20 diet-related metabolites that were associated with overall breast cancer in our multivariate analysis. We ran these analyses um, with, an, with and without control for body mass index. This is including control for BMI. Only the top three metabolites were statistically significant at a false discovery rate of 0.2. The top metabolite, caprate, was related to consuming butter. Caprate is a medium chain fat, uh, saturated fatty acid that's found in dairy fat. The second top ranked metabolite associated with breast cancer was a gamma tocopherol excretion product, gamma CEHC. And this is a form of vitamin E. Um, that the gamma tocopherols found in uh, vegetable oils. And thirdly, an alcohol-associated metabolite, an adrenal steroid precursor. When we stratified by estrogen receptor subtype, there were 19 diet-associated metabolites that were statistically significantly associated with ER-positive breast cancer. And you can see that most of these are in the lipid pathway, indicated in blue. Here we see that 19 metabolites were statistically significant, and the effect estimates ranged up to um, odds ratios over two. There were 12 alcohol-associated metabolites. Most are related to sex steroid hormone metabolism, specifically androgen pathway metabolites and metabolites downstream of DHEAS. This overall pathway generates estrogen and estradiol, which are well known to be associated with breast cancer. Less is known about the androgens. So alcohol appears to influence um, androgen metabolism along this pathway with downstream cascading effects. There were three metabolites associated with ER-positive breast cancer that are related to fat-containing foods, specifically caprate that I mentioned previously as well as two others that were associated with consuming dairy fat and fried foods. 2-vitamin E-related metabolites were also associated with ER-positive breast cancer, gamma CEHC and delta tocopherol. The greatest dietary sources of uh, gamma and delta tocopherol in the U.S. are vegetable oils and margarine. It's possible that the gamma CEHC here is related to fats used in baking and frying. Uh, here, since our dessert variable included cakes, cookies, donuts, and pies, and in other analyses at the NCI, we've previously found that gamma CEHC 
um, maybe a marker of fried food intake. Another uh, tocopherol isomer, the alpha tocopherol, which was correlated with vitamin E and multivitamin supplement use, was inversely associated with ER positive breast cancer. There were no metabolites associated with ER negative breast cancer at a false discovery rate of 0.2. But I'll just point out that we only had 144 ER negative cases as opposed to 418 ER positive cases. So that might have influenced our power to detect significant associations for this subgroup. Here is a Gaussian graphical model of how the diet-related metabolites relate to each other, conditional on the presence of the other metabolites. And the results here are overlaid with the breast cancer results. So the metabolite names highlighted in pink were positively associated with ER-positive breast cancer, and the ones in purple were inverse associations. Clearly, the metabolites related to breast cancer fell into three distinct metabolic networks. Looking now at some of the top metabolites associated with ER-positive breast cancer, we ran cubic splines to assess uh, linearity. All of the top hits were linearly associated with ER-positive breast cancer, and here you can see the relationship. There were no differences in metabolite breast cancer associations by follow-up time. In a series of sensitivity analyses, we also adjusted for total cholesterol to see if findings changed for tocopherol metabolites, since level of cholesterol affects levels of circulating tocopherols, but we did not see any material differences. We also adjusted alcohol-related steroid metabolites for the non-steroid alcohol-related metabolites, and vice versa. The steroid metabolite ER-positive breast cancer associations were attenuated to some degree, but they still remained statistically significant. Uh, next, we looked at the 113 diet-related metabolites and how they grouped into principal components. So PCA analysis derived three diet-related metabolite components, which we named coffee, um, including 31 metabolites, healthy eating index and multivitamin, which uh, included 23 metabolites, and alcohol, which included nine metabolites. Of these, only the alcohol component was associated with overall and ER positive breast cancer, but not ER negative breast cancer. Some prior studies support that androgen metabolites may mediate uh, the alcohol breast cancer association or point in that direction. This includes a feeding study that provides evidence for a causal association between alcohol and preandrogens, as well as pooled meta-analyses showing that preandrogen metabolites are associated with breast cancer. Androgens can bind to the androgen receptor in breast tissue, and they can trigger breast cell proliferation. They can also be converted to estrogens via aromatase in the breast, and we know that estrogens um, are well known to promote breast carcinogenesis. We also found that dietary fat-related metabolites were associated with breast cancer. The role of dietary fat in breast cancer has been very controversial. Uh, it's been a controversial question for many decades. The vital cohort more recently found that the relationship between dietary fat and breast cancer might differ depending on the fatty acid type. In particular, they also saw a relationship with saturated fat. Many studies had previously only looked at total fat intake, which could potentially have attenuated the association. We also found that parent tocopherols and their metabolites were associated with breast cancer. We saw both positive and inverse associations, but that depended on the tocopherol isomer. There is a literature on the effects of the different forms of tocopherol on the hallmarks of cancer metabolism, but unfortunately the reports are contradictory for both animal and human studies. Uh, here's a graphic and it's exploring some potential reasons why we may have seen a positive association of certain tocopherols with breast cancer. One example is that we might be seeing an overall diet quality effect because both gamma CEHC and delta tocopherol were inversely associated with healthy eating index score. 
there were several strengths and limitations of this study. Uh, the major limitation here was that we were possibly underpowered for the subtype analyses, particularly for the ER negative breast cancer subgroup, uh, which had a third of the sample size as the ER positive group. To summarize, the findings for this second study support that there is a role for diet in breast cancer etiology, particularly for ER positive breast cancer. Our biomarker results implicate the androgen pathway as a mechanism of alcohol-induced carcinogenesis. They also suggest a role for fatty acid and tocopherol metabolism. We plan to replicate this analysis in a new data set from the cancer prevention study where we measured circulating metabolites in a, in a larger study sample of 782 cases and the same number of controls. And I'd just like to thank all of my collaborators on these two studies. All right. I would like to thank Dr. Playden for a very interesting and informative seminar, or sorry, webinar. Um, and I have uh, several questions. Um, let me pull them up. Let me also just so um, very quickly, I just want to change what we're doing here really quickly so we have the right display up. So, okay, wonderful. Okay, so the first question um, is where are the diet metabolomic data for the Finnish males archive? Metabolites or metabolomic workbench um, so the community can use the raw data for further meta analyses. Uh, at this point, the raw data has not been archived. Uh, I'm not actually sure on the protocol at NCI for releasing those data, so I would have to get back to you on that. Yeah. Um, well, we can. I mean, this is this is Chris I'm. Uh, we can talk about it with with um, with you if you're if maybe interested. If you and Dr. Moore are interested in doing that, we can guide you. So I guess that will be to be determined. Um, but thank you for the question. I think it's a, a very good one. Um, for us to be, you know, in general, the community thinking about sort of data deposit, you know, depositing our data. Um, okay, next question: Why, uh, why was the metab, uh, why was the metabolite abundance um, not age corrected, given that the males are in an age range? Um, so, the metabolon data that we received is based on relative. Um, intensities and so um, well we controlled for age in all of the analyses sorry Krista we controlled for age in all the analyses but um, we're not looking at quantitative abundance data okay all right um, okay next question um, as all as all of these data are from untargeted um, LC mass spec and GC mass spec platforms, how were false positives identified and discarded from the data from Metabolon? Um, do you mean false positive associations? So it says here um, as um, it says how were false positives identified and discarded from the data? So I'm, well. Um, Statistically, we, we tried to adjust for uh, multiple, multiple comparisons, <clears throat> unless you are referring to um, ha whether we excluded certain metabolites, various criteria. Um, so whoever asked that question, if you do want to put any um, clarifying points down, I can eventually uh, get to that. Um, I'm not sure if you do have them, but if you type it in, I can try to get back to that um, as we get through some of the questions. Um, okay, the next question is functionally, is linealate um, in the diet beneficial, particularly with respect to cancer risk? Functionally. Um, so uh, as far as um, metabolomics data and breast cancer is concerned. Um, there isn't a lot of data available. Um, in terms of cancer in general, I'm, I'm not actually sure. I would have to get back to you on that. Great. Okay. So the next question, 
um, could you reiterate whether the finished samples had been frozen and stored before analysis and how stable these different metabolites are in stored samples? Um, yes, they had been frozen and stored. I mean, the study, it, we're using baseline um, pre-diagnosis uh, samples, so they'd been stored actually for quite a long time. The study was conducted in the 80s. Um, I don't actually have quality control, access to quality control data specifically um, for that. Okay. So. Um. Next question, could you reiterate what the absolute concentration, oh, sorry, my apologies, could you reiterate what the absolute correlations represent and why they are so often less than 0 0.5? Uh, yeah, so a lot of the diet correlations you saw, particularly for the dietary pattern analysis, were on the range of 0.2 to 0.3. So there is measurement error inherent in self-reported uh, dietary questionnaires, and this contributes to potentially attenuation of these associations. We are planning to do some follow-up studies where we're looking at these diet metabolite relationships based on feeding study data, so we'll be able to get more of an accurate idea of, of true diet metabolite um, correlations based on, you know, gold standard measures of diet. Okay, thanks. Um, so the next question is actually for me, not Dr. Playden, so we're going to give her a break, um, but I am going to answer it because I think I, I've gotten this question several times. I was asked where uh, you all can watch the prior uh, metabolomics webinar presented by Dr. Playden if it was recorded. So I just wanted to clarify that the previous um, presentation by Dr. Playden was in seminar form here at the National Institutes of Health. But because we got so many inquiries about having it uh, be broadcast via webinar, we, uh, she, broad, she presented the exact same thing today on the webinar so that um, the extramural community and people outside of NIH could see that. So what you saw today was more or less what she presented, the same data, um, almost the, I think it was the exact same uh, uh, presentation as was presented in that seminar. So if you were on the call, if you were on the webinar today, you have seen that um, seminar. So I just wanted to answer that so you all know. So on to the next question. Um, why use Bonferroni correction, which is more conservative as compared with Benjamini Hodgeberg, uh, which controls better for false discovery rate? Um, we chose to be more conservative with the diet associations because we had run some prior studies where we'd seen these associations. Um, we've now replicated them over at least three different study populations. We were a li little bit more, um, we used the, the FDR rate with the breast cancer analysis since that was um, agnostic as well, but nothing had been done previously in that area, so we relaxed the criteria slightly. Great, thank you. Um, next question, um, have you thought about doing the same analysis in populations at low risk of breast cancer so as to identify risk-lowering metabolites? Um, I haven't thought about that, but that's something to think about. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bladen. Um, next question, um, did you look at effects of smoking in the diet and breast cancer study? Um, we we controlled the smoking in the analyses. We also um, used smoking biomarkers, for example, creatinine, for additional adjustment to see if it made any difference in the diet metabolite associations, and it did not. Thank you. So I'm going to jump back to clarification regarding the um, functional question. Um, in follow-up to the functional, functionally relevant question, we've observed that the use of radiation to treat diets causes the appearance of many um, lineolate um, metabolites, including C8, C10, and C12 oxidized fatty acid. These, therefore, might be coming from food sources other than butter. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to move back up. I'm trying to manage a lot of questions here, so bear with me. Um, oh, OK. 
um, considering those, metabol uh, those metabolite biomarkers, um, what about specificity and sensitivity of them, like a rock curve? Yeah, that's, that's another approach um, that we'll be taking in our next analysis to, uh, and um, doing more predictive analyses as well. Okay, next question. The alcohol association looks a bit puzzling. Individuals that report drinking no alcohol often do so because they suffer from severe disease. How would your associations look if you excluded the excluded the is it teetotalers? Sorry, I'm trying uh, to. I think I think they mean extreme alcohol drinkers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's something we didn't specifically exclude extreme alcohol consumers, but. Um, Generally, the alcohol consumption wasn't extreme in this population. Okay, next question. Um, you guys are just not going to give Dr. Plain a break here now that you have her for the next 10 minutes. Um, are you considering the role of the gut microbiome in your research? There was a lot of chemistry and biochemistry between the mouth and the blood, and all the action in between will determine which food components or their metabolic products show up in the blood? I think that's a really good point, and that's definitely a really hot area for future research, particularly with the tocopherol findings. I'm interested in following up on that. OK. Somebody's asking, um, remind me when the diet metabolites were analyzed, how long after storing? Um, so it, it would have been many years for the ATBC study that was conducted in the 80s. And the analyses were done, I think, around 2009-ish. So yeah, there, is, there are storage issues. A lot of these quality control um, issues we really do need to explore in the field of metabolomics to find out you know, what is the degradation um, over time. That's an important thing to consider. I just I don't know specifically in in this case the effects on the metabolites. But even though those samples were stored for a very long time, we still were able to replicate a lot of associations um, in that study um, and the PLCO study, which uh, those samples were not stored nearly as long. So okay, on to the next question. Do you see any difference in the correlation between metabolite and dietary quality index in the PLCO and ATBC studies? One used non-fasting blood and one used fasting blood. Yeah, so the PLCO study, there was one nested case control study, which was a lot smaller. And um, I think I mentioned in that one slide that there was a little bit of overlap, but not a whole lot of overlap. Um, so, sorry, remind me. Um, question. The question was, uh, do you see any difference in the correlation between metabolite and dietary um, quality index? Yeah. So the, the, the magnitudes of correlations were similar. The actual metabolites that came out um, were different somewhat, which could have something to do, as I mentioned, with the differences in population intakes. Also, the um, metabolites were measured at different time points, and the sensitivity sensitivity of the platform changes over time. So the newer platforms pick up a lot more metabolites as well. Okay, it does make it difficult to compare across studies that have been measured at different times. Okay, next question. Given all of the known associations between carotenoids and cancer risk, I'm surprised that there weren't any um, carotene cancer relationships which emerged. Can you comment on whether the Metabolon analytical platform used analyzed lipid-soluble components like carotenoids? Since the tocopherols were determined, it seems that the extraction method and analytical method may have been able uh, to measure um, lipophilic phytochemicals like carotenoids. Yeah, I think a lot of the carotenoids that have been reported in the literature we did not have in our metabolite profile. 
so we weren't able to assess that. Can we use um, conical correlation uh, multiple to multiple rather than one to one in this study? I'm not sure about that. Okay, sorry. It's okay. You've been, gotten a ton of questions, so. Um, okay. Are all the metabolite IDs confirmed by uh, MSMS? Yeah, uh, Metabolon has its proprietary library of chemical standards for identification. So it's proprietary. All right. Okay, and then um, I, I think this goes back to the alcohol question, which would be, I think the previous questioner, I think it was um, meant that some people may report that they don't drink alcohol because they can't due to interactions with certain drugs, et cetera. So how would your results change if you excluded the non-drinkers? Um, that's something that we could look at. I didn't exclude non-drinkers. This was more of an agnostic analysis looking at all of the ITER exposures, but it's something, you know, if we were looking at specifically at alcohol as an exposure where we could, we could do a series of sensitivity analyses to see how things changed. Okay. Um, oh, okay. All right. Um, next question. Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using Metabolon's platform versus one of the NIH regional comprehensive metabolomics resource cores or a university lab with adequate resources? Um, we've used Metabolon here for a number of studies. They uh, do have a very, very extensive chemical reference library, so we're able to get quite a large number of identifiable metabolites very quickly. Um, so that's, that's a benefit to this platform. But um, I think, um, you know, there are, there are pros and cons to, to using different platforms that probably beyond the scope of this talk. All right. Um, okay, so, um, I don't have any more questions popping up in the feed. However, um, I do want to give people at least another minute um, to ensure that there are no additional questions because people could be typing. Um, so I do want to, I'm just going to pause for a second if anyone is typing and then we can um, ask a final bit of questions. We have about four minutes. Oh, okay, we got one. Um, okay. Okay. Um, how do you suppose that in future studies that we are going to be able to account for dietary intake of participants and measuring the metabolites and dealing with variability in the participants due to gut microbiota? I'm sorry, to make dietary suggestions um, for certain health outcomes, do we need to know how many different individuals may respond to different diets and foods? For example, Two people consume the exact same diet but produce different metabolite outcomes. This may even be the case among healthy adult comparisons. So there are two questions there. So if you need me to re, re, uh, re, restate any of it, let me know. Do you want to start with a? Yeah. I'm going to. Re oh, go ahead. Um, I think I think one of the previous questions kind of alluded to this, but it it is definitely something of interest for follow-up in future studies to look at the effect of the microbiome on the variability of these metabolite levels. We did not have this data for these analyses, so I couldn't look at that. But it's definitely something that could be followed up on in the future. And then the second part was to make, diet, make dietary suggestions for certain health outcomes. Do we need to know how different individuals may respond to different diets and foods? For example, two people consume the exact same diet but produce different metabolite outcomes. This may even be the case among healthy adult comparisons. Yeah, um, um, as, as research, well, as guidelines take a more personalized, individualized approach, um, you know, that it sounds like a promising area, the microbiome, to explore some of those differences. Okay. Um, the network diagrams 
went by quickly, how are they generated? Are the distances related to the um, false discovery rate? Um, so we did a, a GGM analysis, and then we visualized it in Cytoscape, and the edges were connected to metabolites that had um, direct relationships or direct correlations conditional on the other metabolites of at least 0.2. Okay. Um, was there accounting for stability of these metabolites during the course of your analyses? For instance, with pooled quality control samples um, analyzed with your patient samples? Yes. Okay. QCs were inserted. Um, technical replicates and pooled QCs. We ran ICCs and everything. Um, okay. Yep. So um, I have one more question. Uh, oh, that was the last question, and we are at 1.59, and I like to stay, for anybody that actually knows me, I like to stay on time, so we're going to do that today. Um, I would like to thank you all for your attention and active participation in today's NIH Metabolomics Interest Group webinar. Um, I think that this was a fantastic number of questions, and clearly people were engaged, which is really exciting for us, since this is only, I think, our, I think, um, our or third, or this is our third, I think, um, webinar. So um, I'm really excited to see that and that we're bringing the community together um, to, uh, to have the opportunity to discuss some of these things uh, via this, um, this mechanism. And I especially would like to take the opportunity to thank um, our presenter today, Dr. Mary Playden, for an excellent presentation and um, hanging in there and answering more questions than I think I've ever seen anybody have to answer at the end of a webinar. So thank you so very much. And we would welcome your feedback um, to inform future webinars. And again, thank you all very much for your participation.